tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. Christy Martin of Houston, Texas was talented, attractive, and intelligent. She was just 19, poised to take her place in the world. Then a quiet evening out with friends was shattered by a deadly confrontation. Tonight, Christy Martin's parents and the authorities in Houston need your help to bring her killers to justice. Join me for this intriguing new case, as well as these fascinating mysteries. A college athlete bounds from his bed and sprints through the frigid winter night. A young woman dreams of being chased and crashes through her patio door. Both are trapped in a world science has yet to understand, the mysterious world of sleepwalking. On the day Lois Caprizella was reunited with her birth father's family, she was stunned to learn that her search was not over. Perhaps someone watching can help find the twin sister Lois never knew she had. It took years of constant fighting before Jim and Susan Harrison finally called it quits. Eight months later, Susan vanished. Now her children believe Jim Harrison knows exactly what happened to their mother. In 1988, an arson fire killed six firefighters in Kansas City, Missouri. Thanks in part to our broadcast, five suspects are now in custody. Join me for another intriguing edition of Unsolved Mysteries. happens when we sleep. The ancient Egyptians believed that dreams are a window to the future. But where do dreams come from? Does a mind work differently when the body is resting? What happens when a person is suspended between wakefulness and sleep? This man was filmed at a university laboratory. He is sound asleep. And though he is hooked up to some of the most sophisticated monitoring devices known to science, no one can say why he is crawling around as though he were wide awake. Yeah. It's a world beyond dreams, a mysterious world of sleepwalking. Though often portrayed as harmless or amusing, sleepwalking can in reality be dangerous, even deadly. Tonight, two young athletes pushed to the edge by life-threatening sleep disorders. First, the strange and tragic case of Jared Allgood. A talented football player during his waking hours, Jared Allgood was an habitual sleepwalker at night. From the time he was a young boy, Jared was known to wander around the house, slamming doors and occasionally bumping into walls, but never awakening. He was a, a major sleepwalker, and all of my boys are. And that scared me, and I'd talk about it, and I'd ask the doctors about it. And they would just pretty much poo-poo it, like it's really nothing, because I, I had asked quite a few times in their lives, all of my children in their lives, you know, is this, this is normal? Are they supposed to be doing this, you know? When Jared went to college in Iowa, the episodes continued. None were serious until the early morning hours of February 9th, 1993. Jared was up, his eyes wide open, but he was not awake. Jared ran more than a mile barefoot on the icy pavement. Witnesses later reported that he sprinted with the urgency of a runner at the finish line. People who have these episodes spontaneously, like Jared, get stuck in this state between wakefulness and sleep. And awake enough to perform complex behaviors, not awake enough to be aware of what we're doing or responsible for what we're doing. Somehow in his sleep, Jared had managed to exit his apartment, 
weave around parked cars and turn corners as he ran. Then in mid-stride, tragedy. Jared Allgood died instantly. Initially, authorities speculated that he had committed suicide. Jared's mother didn't buy it. When Becky Allgood talked to her son's roommate, he told her that Jared had been having a recurrent dream that involved a man from the nearby town of Bertram. Jared said, it's a crazy dream. I'm running a race with a man from Bertram, only the man is in a car, and I'm on foot, running a race, as hard as I can run. Was Jared playing out his jumbled dream the night he died? Some might dismiss it as mere coincidence. But Jared was killed as he raced down State Highway 30, the highway that leads to Bertram. <laughs> Becky Allgood became absolutely convinced that her son had not taken his own life. The experts agreed. There was not one shred of evidence that he had depression or any other reason to commit suicide. There was no evidence of drugs or alcohol involved. There was absolutely no reason in the world for him to have been out there. And the whole circumstance was so inappropriate that the only reasonable explanation is that this was yet just another one of his sleepwalking episodes. In the end, authorities bowed to the evidence. Jared had apparently been sound asleep from the moment he got out of bed to the moment he was killed on the highway. Jared Allgood became the first person in Iowa history whose death was ascribed to sleepwalking. When I hear stories about Jared Allgood, I think that possibly could have been me. And that, that scares me to think that. Like Jared, Heidi Ruiz is a dedicated athlete. Her sleepwalking began in 1991. She was attending college on a track and field scholarship and felt a crushing pressure to perform. <laughs> Heidi's sleepwalking invariably seemed rooted in a nameless, faceless terror. I wasn't running from a particular person or a thing. I was just running because I felt like it was the end of the world. The scariest part was not knowing what I was doing and the feeling that I had inside when I woke up out of the night terror. I just, I can't even explain it. It was like a monster inside me trying to get out. I heard a blood curdling scream. A scream at the top. Heidi's mother witnessed two of the most violent episodes. All of a sudden, bang, two big hits where I could hear her coming through doors. Help me! I have to tell you, the force of her running through that hall, I will never forget, because of the tear, the looking of tear on her face was so incredible. And for a mom to not know what to do in order for her not to be able to hurt herself again was... Um, a real scary thing, real scary. I had the biggest episode was in my mom's house back in August of 95. Must have gotten out of bed and took one step and bolted straight into the wall. The impact tore open Heidi's forehead. She gashed her wrist as she fell to the floor. Did you fall down, honey? I decided I couldn't handle it anymore. I was terrified, and I said, I need to get go seek help. Heidi was tested at the world-renowned Stanford University Sleep Clinic in Northern California. I'll give you a, a different look completely here. I had electrodes all over my head. I had a pulse on my finger. I mean, I was hooked up. Like, I felt like I was from Mars. <laughs> it was very, very uncomfortable. But it was an extensive test, and they had to see what was going on with me. We're through a testing process here in a moment or so. We wanted to see if we might be able to capture a sleepwalking episode. But that can be rare, because it might not occur every night. Uh, but secondly, we also wanted to rule out the possibility that it um, wasn't something else, such as seizure activity, a sleep-related breathing disorder, or even leg movements that were causing the person to awaken and triggering off an attack. In Heidi's case, uh, we really didn't see any of those uh, triggers. While Dr. Kushida could find no physiological causes for Heidi's sleepwalking, 
he was able to pinpoint circumstances likely to kick off an episode. There's a lot of different triggers. Uh, one of them is sleep deprivation. That's known to definitely increase the chance of, of sleepwalking if the person is sleep deprived. Um, secondly, stress can also increase the chance that the person might have um, sleepwalking. Both Heidi Ruiz and Jared Allgood fit that pattern. Their sleepwalking fared up under heavy emotional pressure and lack of sleep. Heidi has now brought her sleepwalking under control through medication and careful stress management. Unfortunately, a lot of sleep is still a mystery, a big mystery in terms of a lot of the causes of these sleep disorders, but you know, it's something that we're all trying to really work hard on. The phantasmagoric world of sleep and dreams, once the domain of poets, has become the target of mainstream research. But after decades of testing, scientists can still only ponder the mysteries of the night. It is important to note that while researchers cannot fully explain sleepwalking, they are able to control it in most cases. If you or someone you know is suffering from a serious sleep disorder, it should not be ignored. Please consult a trained physician. You know, everyone knows that you're going to die sometime in your life, but you expect to die when you're old, not when you're 19 years old. I think if Christy would have died from sickness or in a car wreck, it would just be a lot easier to accept than the fact that she was actually murdered because it was just senseless and there was no reason for it at all. Christy Martin, an honor roll student and former high school cheerleader, was gunned down two days before Christmas in 1995. That Friday evening, she and a friend named Wendy Wright double dated with two brothers, Joe and Sal Barrera. Question. Uh, I got you a good present, though. What'd you get? The four had known each other in high school. Christmas break from college was a perfect time to reconnect. <laughs> Just 15 miles, yet worlds distant from the restaurant, members of an East Houston street gang were cranking up their Friday night. Hey, Flacco. What's up, Holmes? What's up, Flacco? Come on over here, man. On the night of the uh, homicide, Jose Luis Rios, whose uh, gang name is Flaco, and Jorge Mendez were out that night, riding around drinking, looking for some kind of uh, problems to get into, looking to do something wild. Hey, look, where's the party at? I've dealt with Flaco before. He's told people in the past that it was the ultimate rush, the ultimate high to shoot somebody. Across town, the two couples finished their meal. They headed to River Terrace Park, a popular hangout for generations. Christie's dad had gone there as a child. When we were kids, we fished there, crabbed there, we picnicked there. Uh, you never had to worry about anybody bothering you for any reason. Uh, it was just a nice place to take your family. That might be why one of the reasons the kids went there, they felt safe there. Man, I'm cold. I'm going to get inside. You want to go inside? Oh, yeah. Well, Chris, do you want to go for a walk? I'll go for a walk, yeah. Unbeknownst to Christy and her friends, the park was no longer neutral territory. Flacco's gang liked to think it was theirs and theirs alone. Is that over there, Essen? I don't know. Let's go check it out. You want to? Yeah. Let's go. Andale, andale, andale. Hurry, let's go. I drive it up for we were just sitting there talking. When the truck drove up, I, I couldn't see it because my back was towards him. Sal Barrera, who still lives in Houston, asked that we obscure his features for this interview. I thought it was just somebody else going to park next to us, you know, so they could, you know, do whatever they wanted to do. We probably need to go, okay? No, look, just ignore him. Can we I mean, just probably go? Drunk. Come on! Let's Come go. On. Whatever it is. I got it. I got it. I got it. I crawled a 
as fast as I could to the front of my car. By the time I got to the front, they took off. I just see Christy, you know, on the floor, just, you know, laying there. I just ran, ran over there Christy. towards her, and I was talking to her, yelling, please don't go, don't leave us. Oh, God. Chris. Christy. She's just there, and breathing slowly and just staring at you. You knew she was already going to die. I mean, she had the glare in her eye, like she was trying to look at you, but looking past you, you know? Wendy Wright and the Barrera brothers escaped without serious injury. However, Christy Martin had taken a direct hit from a semi-automatic assault rifle. She died at the scene. When Christy didn't come home, my concern was maybe she had a car accident. I never dreamed in a million years it would be something such as a drive-by shooting because I guess I just assumed that only happened to other people, that it didn't happen to somebody that was a good person and that wasn't involved in gangs. It, you know, anyway at all. Six days after the shooting, Jose Rios, alias Flacco, was formally charged with killing Christy Martin. He and Jorge Mendez, who reportedly drove the getaway truck, had previous run-ins with the law. Mendez was also charged with murder. Four weeks before the attack, Mendez had legally purchased the assault rifle allegedly used by Flacco in the killing. It's hard to swallow that these kids are able to get out there and buy assault-type weapons and then to come back and just fire them at will at anybody they want. Well, the type of gun that this man bought, I don't even call him a man, this animal bought, is sold to kill people. He bragged to some of his gang members that he was going to kill somebody with it. He bought this gun to kill somebody with it. Just so happened it was our daughter. Flacco has now been linked to a second killing. In March of 1996, an uncle of Jorge Mendez was gunned down at an intersection. The uncle had told Jorge, along with uh, Flacco, uh, that if they didn't turn themselves in, that he would call the police on them himself. Uh, and within two days of that uh, reported meeting between them, uh, he ends up being shot. The information we're picking up off the street is that Jose Luis Rios Flacco is also taking credit uh, for that homicide. While Flacco runs free, Brian and Judy Martin are already starting to dread the one year anniversary of their daughter's funeral, Christmas Eve. Christmas will be really hard from now on. It just will never be the same. So it, it's really a sad time. and. I know Christmas should be a happy time, but I, I can't imagine it being any sadder than Christmas Eve will be this year without Christy. Losing your mother or a brother, I mean, that's rough. I've lost them both. My dad, both my parents have died, my brother has died. All I have left is my family, my immediate family. And uh, when you lose a child, it takes a big hunk out of your heart. Jose Luis Rios, also known as Flacco, is a lean 5'7", 130. He has numerous tattoos, two teardrops under his left eye, a knife sticking into a skull on his right forearm, and on his left middle finger, the outline of a cross. Next, a joyous family reunion gives rise to an intriguing unsolved mystery. Does this woman have an identical twin sister? Also an act of arson leaves six firefighters dead. Eight years later, the hunt for suspects comes to a close. You may recall these dramatic scenes from a previous broadcast. Firefighters in Kansas City, Missouri, volunteered to help us recreate an unsolved crime that left six of their comrades dead. 
On November 29, 1988, pumpers 30 and 41 were called to a construction site where a trailer had been torched by arsonists. There were explosives at the scene, but a survey of the area suggested they had been secured in storage sheds, known as bunkers. Just the fact that the bunker was there, in fact, there was two bunkers there, led that captain to believe that's where the explosives was, and this trailer was just a regular, normal construction trailer with tools and equipment in it, and therefore, there was no danger. However, when the department supervisor arrived, he learned that there were, in fact, large quantities of explosives inside the trailer. Let's get him out of there, John. 107. Pumper 41 or pumper 30, answer. Sunrise confirmed what Kansas City had been dreading. Six of their firefighters were dead. I guess I feel like if I knew who did it, we'd know why they did it. And I don't think they were trying to kill six firemen, but somebody was trying to do something to somebody, and six men are gone. The shocking crime triggered the biggest manhunt in the city's history. But after nearly eight years, those responsible were still running free. Then Kansas City firemen pushed aside painful memories to help us get this story on the air. Keely Shea Smith has more. Bob, the efforts of the Kansas City Fire Department paid off in a big way. More than 600 calls poured into our phone center and two hotlines set up by local authorities. The infusion of new leads led directly to the indictment of five suspects. When the long-awaited news was announced at a press conference last June, the excitement was tempered by lingering emotions. Even though it was very difficult for many of us who participated in that recreation of that event, it came at a time when many of our spirits were down, leads had gone off, and we needed a lift, and we got a lift. All five suspects are now facing a federal arson charge. George Frank Shepard, his brother Earl, their nephew Brian Shepard, Frank Shepard's girlfriend Darlene Edwards, and Richard W. Brown. Citing the pending trial, authorities declined to speculate on motive. If convicted, the suspects could spend the rest of their lives in prison. Tonight is November 8th, 1996, and somewhere a young woman is likely celebrating her 33rd birthday. She has no idea that she has an entire clan of loving relatives eager to meet her. With your help, she may find out tonight. Hey, she's here! July 21st, 1995, Altadena, California. It was a day of homecoming. The day Marjorie Kim and her long-lost granddaughter, Lois Capazello, will never forget. We all felt just a click the minute we met. It's hard to explain how total strangers who know nothing about each other can just click and bond in a matter of moments within one hug. It was like an answer to a prayer that I had prayed for 32 years, knowing that she was out there. We've been anxious just as much, waiting. 32 years, Lois and Marjorie had waited to meet each other. But it was hardly the end of the search. In fact, it was just the beginning of a new quest, a quest neither had imagined possible. Hello. Lois Capazella was born in November of 1963 and adopted almost immediately. 
Her birth father was Marjorie Kim's son, John, a policeman who died in 1979. Years before, when John was only 17, he learned that his high school sweetheart, Judy, was pregnant. The news threw both households into turmoil. By the time Lois was born, the families were barely on speaking terms. Marjorie had wanted to adopt the baby, but Judy's parents would not permit it. Judy's sister came by on the sly to give Marjorie word of the birth. Oh, hi, Patty. Hi. Come on in. No, I can't. I've got to get back home. Look, I just wanted to tell you that Judy gave birth today. Oh, gosh. A boy or a girl? Twins. Girls. Oh, how wonderful. But <clears throat> one of them died. Oh, poor Judy. How's she doing? She's doing all right. Well, can I come see her? No, I don't think that would be a good idea. Look, I've got to get going. Well, I'll give her my best. I will. And thanks for coming. Sure. It was not a happy time. And that date always stuck in my mind over the years. She'll be two, she'll be three, she'll be four, she'll be five. On through the years. Those painful thoughts continued until the day of the reunion. The introductions were barely over when Marjorie and Lois realized that the past still held a perplexing mystery. It's good to see you too, Grandma. You should have come back. What do you mean? Honey, you should have come back. I'd never been to her house before, so to have someone tell, tell me why didn't I come back, I was very confused, and I said, I don't understand what you're asking me, and she goes, well, you've been here before. Yes, you were, honey, about 15 years ago, huh, Derek? Lois's cousin, Derek Stain, remembered vividly. And I was in the front, and I was riding my bike, and a car pulled up, and a girl got out. Oh, there's somebody here. Hi. Hi. Can I help you? I'm looking for Judy Kim. Does she live here? Well, this is the Kim residence, but I'm sorry, there's no Judy here. There isn't? No. Well, do you know any Judy Kim? I'm sorry. Is there somewhere I could help you? No. No, it's okay. I'm sorry to bother you. Thanks. Why does that girl look so familiar? I know her from somewhere. It was Derek who made the connection. She sure looked like Uncle John. And then it hit me, and to myself, I said, dear God, I let her leave. It was Johnny's daughter, and I let her leave. She said, she looked just like your father. She looked like you. I, you know, I don't understand. If you haven't been here, who was it? My twin. But she died. What if she didn't? Oh, God, Lois. Oh, God. It's like a little thing in your stomach just kind of clenches up and you're just thinking, oh my God, you know, she didn't die. She's alive and she's, you know, walking around there somewhere searching, just as I did. Adoption agencies often try to keep twins together. Lois and the Kims now suspect someone claimed that one twin died in order to make it easier to place the babies. Lois looked for a death certificate for her twin. But despite a thorough search, she found nothing. I think the lack of any of that information proves to me that she is alive and that that girl who came to the door was my twin sister. I'm looking for Judy Kim. Does she live here? Well, this is the Kim residence. Incredibly, when Lois contacted her birth mother's family, they told an almost identical story. A mysterious young girl had shown up at their home at around the same time. Is there somewhere I could help you? I am sure in my heart no. that the girl that came to my house 15, 16 Sorry, years ago was my son John's daughter, the twin. I would love with all my heart to see her, 
to be able to see her. Like God answered my prayers with Lois. Well, Let's sit on a knee, shall we? For Lois, finding her father's family has been a wonderfully rich and rewarding experience, an experience she hopes to soon share with her twin sister. Hang on, I got a couple hot dogs. Hot dog will do it. She has a family who loves her, who'd like to get to know her. We may have missed the first 30 years or so of our life, but we have many more to get to know each other. And that I'd like to meet her and have her be a part of my life. Lois's twin sister was born at St. Anne's Maternity Hospital in Los Angeles. The date on the birth certificate would be either November 8th or November 13th, 1963. Lois's twin would have been 16 or 17 when she visited the Kims in the late 70s. Today she is 33 years old and would no doubt look very much like Lois Capazello. In a moment, two brothers search for answers in the baffling disappearance of their mother. They're about to meet two young men on a desperate quest to find out what happened to their mother. She disappeared more than two years ago. The police are convinced that she is dead, the victim of foul play. And her sons are convinced that their stepfather is the one person who may know what happened. August 5th, 1994. In the late afternoon, 19-year-old Nick Owsley arrived at his mother's house in Ruxton, Maryland. They had planned to spend the evening together. The door was ajar, and she was nowhere to be found. Mom? Hey, Mommy, how? Her car was gone, and a set of keys lay on the kitchen table. Nick waited until 2 AM, then Mom? went home for the night. Mom, you all right? When I woke up that uh, morning, uh, I was really concerned, called her house, and, uh, and she didn't answer. And, uh, at that moment, I realized that something was really, really wrong. And uh, I felt like, at that point, she was probably dead because it was so unlike her and so out of character. And basically, I haven't uh, felt anything different since that moment. We had a memorial service, but we never had a funeral. And that kills me. The fact that she's out there somewhere, um, this wonderful, amazing woman who did so much for so many people, and we can't give her that final tribute and do what's right. Susan Hurley Harrison grew up in a wealthy, close-knit Massachusetts family. In 1967, she married one of her brother's roommates at Harvard. Their sons, John and Nick, were born five years apart. But in 1984, Susan left her husband and became involved with a man named Jim Harrison. Four years later, they were married. From the start, the relationship was reportedly marked by heavy drinking, frequent fights, and mutual abuse, problems which Jim Harrison attributes to Susan's alleged manic depression. Susan, when she was not manic depressive, was just a wonderful woman and a wonderful wife. And when the manic depressive aspect came on periodically, that was bad. She would start screaming and yelling and she would start destroying things in or around the house. And she would run and around the house and use bad language. It was, it was really sad and really tough. It's, a, it's another excuse that he tries to use, tries to take the blame from himself for what, even now, even still, even when she's not around to say, OK, maybe it was my fault. Well, I think the first time that I recognized that there was abuse in the relationship was when I actually saw abuse myself when I was about 12 years old. Susan and her ex-husband shared custody of Nick and John. On the night Nick claims he witnessed abuse, John was off visiting prospective colleges. Nick was staying with his mother and Jim Harrison. Get away Listen. from me! Listen, don't tell me what to do. This is my house. I pay for it. You don't bring anything into the I house. I remember waking up around 2 in the morning, 1 or 2 in the morning, and, uh, and hearing voices and some screaming. Be quiet. Mom? What's going on out there? And she said, Jim's been hurting me. He won't leave me alone. We'll fight. Jim won't leave me alone. 
Are you okay? And I said, well, I gotta get out of here. And so I called my brother's girlfriend at the time and talked with her, and she said, you, know, you should get out of there. I'll come pick you up, go outside, stay in the driveway, and, uh, and then I'll come get you. Nick says that while he waited, a battle moved outside. You forgot these! Open that truck! Open that truck! I don't want those ugly lampshades around! Open that truck! Leave her alone! Are you okay? I see my mother as a victim of domestic violence and a, a victim of abuse. And uh, I think that she was caught up in a vicious cycle that a lot of women who are in those same situations are caught up in, and that it's just very difficult for them to leave. The only thing I've ever done is defended myself when she attacked me. And to some degree, that involved my simply leaving the house for a day or so and other times putting myself into the bedroom and closing the door and just trying not to let her abuse me. But I've never abused her, never. Uh, our uniformed police officers had been called to their home on a number of occasions for a cause of domestic violence. And when they responded to the home, they found uh, on occasion Susan had some injuries that were questionable. Uh, there had been some drinking on both parties and it was usually a very confused situation for the officer to determine exactly what had happened. Finally, in January of 1994, Susan left Jim Harrison. She rented a house and launched her own business, selling handcrafted lampshades. She felt very good about it. She called me a couple of times and said, you know, so this is what you've been talking about all these years. And she just said what a wonderful feeling it was to know that she could go out there and do something on her own. Um, she said at the end of the day, she felt so good having worked all day at this. And um, so there was a lot, we thought that she was finally getting herself together. However, that wasn't the case. Susan was still seeing Jim Harrison on occasion. By all accounts, the fighting continued unabated. I found out, she told me, that she had seen him a couple of times. And uh, obviously that made me angry, made me feel sick to my stomach. All of a sudden I saw the slippery slope and I saw it, her sliding back into all the things that she'd worked so hard to get out of. And, uh, and that worried me. You know that. Nick Owsley shared his brother's concerns. <laughs> Nick says that in early August of 1994, he confronted his mother and delivered an ultimatum. I want this to end now. It's either Jim or us. Family members say that the next morning, Susan decided to leave Jim for good. But just two days later, Susan Harrison disappeared, and police went to speak with Jim Harrison. He told them that Susan had visited him on three separate occasions a previous day. Yes, I'm Officer Knott. This is Officer Rogers. And the third time, she arrived about 7, and she attacked me verbally, and it was very discouraging. And she asked for glasses of wine, and I gave her what she asked for. And she went to sleep and w woke up, and she entirely changed. And she was delightful and good, and it was very loving and wonderful. You could decorate this room just the way you always wanted. According to Jim Harrison, he and Susan drank wine and talked for about two hours. Around 9 p.m., Susan took another nap. And when she woke up, it had gone bad again. I was just wondering if maybe it was a dream that she had that caused her to go bad instead of staying good. Jim, why did you change the locks in the house? Susan, we went through this an hour ago. So tell me again. I didn't change the locks in the house. I changed the locks in the family room. It's my house and you changed the locks, yes, Jim. Yes, it is your house. Now just calm down. What is that? Problems with the power. Jim, Jim Harrison claims that Susan's mood turned uglier by the minute. Susan, just I, calm down. Don't tell me to calm, calm down. I'm sick of down, lying down. You? Don't. And don't walk away from Good me. Night. Don't walk away from me. Talk to me. Susan, you're being bad again. I left the family room and went upstairs to my bedroom, and she followed me to the bottom of the steps. And she stayed there and yelled at me up the steps for a short period. 
and then left. Left the house and started her car and drove out. Police found no flaws in Jim Harrison's account. Then three weeks later, Susan's car, a 1992 green Saab convertible, was discovered at National Airport in Washington, D.C., some 50 miles from Baltimore. Records show that the car entered the parking lot around 6 a.m. on August 6, 1994, the day Susan disappeared. The keys were in the ignition, the gas tank was full, raising the possibility that Susan had simply walked away from her life. Well, in any missing person investigation, you know, we approach it in a several prong manner. Could they be missing on their own accord and that don't want to be found, or is there foul play? And we haven't uncovered any information that would lead credence to her trying to disappear in any fashion whatsoever. In November of 1994, Jim Harrison agreed to take a polygraph. He has publicly admitted that he failed the test, but claims the test was not administered properly. Today, Jim Harrison maintains he had nothing to do with his wife's disappearance. I love Susan. And I really do pray to God that she's alive and well. And I pray to God that you all can help find her and please do your best to help find her. There's no indications of what we may consider a, a, a stranger type of killer. So we feel that what happened to Susan was committed by someone close to her, that there had been some type of a dispute and someone lost control and circumstances um, took a tragic uh, twist. I have dreams of walking down the street with her or just running into her somewhere and, and all this time she's, she's been gone, finally getting a chance to be with her again. And uh, I know it's just a dream. I know that there's not a chance that she's ever going to come back, but, uh, but I just, I, I miss her so much and, and I uh, at least get to see her, you know, in these dreams and, and, and get to be with her. But, uh, but there's no doubt in my mind that she'll never, ever be able to be with me again. On our next Unsolved Mysteries, what happens when we die? For a man named Howard Storm, a medical emergency took him to the brink of death and on a personal journey into the very depths of hell. That place was more full of torment and despair than anything you could ever imagine in this world. It was a place where you wouldn't want to send your worst enemy. Join me again next time for Unsolved Mysteries.